I remember it like it was yesterday. It's been over 10 years since my dad died. He was 80 years old and he was working till the day he went into the hospital. And so his death was completely unexpected. I remember my first funeral as a young pastor in Denver, Colorado. It was for a six-month-old baby. His name was Jesse. He had died from sudden infant death syndrome. I remember sitting in a hospital ICU waiting room with my mom as my dad was going under emergency heart surgery. They told us he wouldn't make it through the night if he didn't have the surgery. They couldn't finish the surgery and they were rolling him back into his ICU room and I can remember clearly hearing the sound over the intercom, code blue and my dad's room number being called. I remember the heroic t attempts to bring my dad back to life, but to no avail. I remember my mom's wailing in disbelief. This isn't how it's supposed to end. I remember sitting in a mobile home outside of Denver with baby Jesse's parents. I remember the uncontrollable wailing as they retold the events of earlier that day about discovering the lifeless body of their baby in his crib. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Hear my voice. Of all the emotions that wring our heart out, surely there is none that, that goes deeper than that of grief. And the Bible is filled with all sorts of stories recounting God's people who have been grieving. There's Abraham as he mourns and weeps by the side of his wife Sarah's lifeless body. There's Jacob holding, clinging to his son Joseph's bloodstained cloak, crying in inconsolable anguish. It's my son's robe. Or King David, as he hears of the death of his rebellious son, Absalom. Oh, my son, my son, my son. Would it have been I that died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. C.S. Lewis, the author, in what is perhaps his most personal of writings, and it's perhaps my favorite, A Grief Observed. It's basically his journal that he, he wrote, sharing his deepest personal thoughts and emotions following the death of his wife, Joy. And he writes, No one ever told me that grief felt so like fear. I'm not afraid, but the sensation is like being afraid. The same fluttering in the stomach, the same restlessness, the yawning. I keep on swallowing. At other times, it feels like being mildly drunk or concussed. There's a sort of invisible blanket between the world and me, and I find it hard to take in what anyone says, or perhaps hard to want to take it in. It is so uninteresting. Yes, I want others to be about me. I dread the moments when the house is empty. If only they would talk to one another and not to me. There are moments, most unexpectedly, when something inside me tries to assure me that I don't really mind so much. Not so very much, after all. Love is not the whole of a man's life. I was happy before I ever met her. I have plenty of what are called resources. People get over these things. Come, I shan't do so badly. 
Then comes a jab of red-hot memory, and all of this common sense vanishes like an ant in the mouth of a furnace. C.S. Lewis, like Mary and Martha in the gospel that we just heard read, the two sisters desperately, desperately grieving. This grief of Mary and Martha has long resonated with me for its complete transparency and the honesty connecting to what most of us all know all too well. In this account, we come face to face with grief as we enter midway through the story of Lazarus, Jesus just arriving in Bethany. When Lazarus' sister Martha learns the news that Jesus has arrived, she rushes out to meet him. But she can't hold back. She can't hold back her feelings of questioning and perhaps some resentment. Those feelings that are swelling up inside her. And so her first words to Jesus are, Lord, if you'd only have been here, my brother would not have died. And so going back to the backstory, a few days earlier, Mary and Martha, they've sent a message to Jesus telling him that their brother Lazarus is sick, very sick. They felt there was plenty of time for Jesus to get there, to be with them while their brother was still alive. But for some reason, it seems, Jesus had delayed leaving for two days. And now when he arrives, Lazarus is dead. They've already buried him. Mary and Martha aren't trying to be rude to Jesus. But they are being honest. Their hearts are overwhelmed. And many times, I think we're tempted, at least I am. I'm tempted to try to hide these deepest thoughts and feelings from God. Far more often than I care to admit, my prayers will skirt the issues of my hurts and my struggles. It's easy to spend a lot of energy to try to keep the wallpaper, the nice wallpaper in place to hide the imperfections and the hurt and the pain in my soul, in my life, in my heart. I'm not always willing or open to share with God my, my, my deepest hurts and disappointments. And if you and I are honest with ourselves, there are in life most certainly situations that cause us to blurt out, God, why didn't you do something? Why didn't you stop this? Now those aren't only real and important questions and thoughts and feelings. They are perfectly legitimate to raise and express directly to God. One of the repeated prayers of the Bible is, Oh Lord, how long? Psalm 13 says, Oh Lord, how long will you forget me forever? How long, O oh Lord, will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? In Psalm 89, it says again, How long, O oh Lord, will you hide yourself? In Habakkuk, it says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen? And again in the Psalm, How long, O oh Lord, will you look on? Just imagine one of your family members gets sick. It's pretty easy to imagine right now in this time of coronavirus. It's a very real fear for many people. Fear that someone who has gotten sick will get sick very quickly. And they, they, they're so sick they start to decline at such a fast rate that you don't have time to communicate just how serious this is. And you try to, to go to someone that can help. And before you get there, their condition worsens. So you throw the message to the only one you can think that can help because modern medicine, even today in this environment of coronavirus, is limited. And you're scared that your loved one is going to die. You're trying to do everything you can, humanly possible, to help them. And you're down to the only thing you have left. And finally, finally you find yourself crying out to the only one who you believe can do anything in this situation. You know, you know that Jesus could fix this. 
But he needs to get here quickly because this virus is aggressive and it will not wait. That paints the picture for you. It connects you, I hope, to some of what Mary and Martha must have been feeling. Anxiously and fearfully, yet faithfully they wait. That's the backdrop being laid out as Jesus arrives. And Martha comes running to Jesus with these words, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would not have died. In in that statement, there also lies a question. A question of why. Why didn't you come when we first sent the message? But the words are also a profound statement of faith. Lord, I believe that you're the son of God. You're the Messiah, the one coming into the world. In fact, it was her faith in Jesus that gave her the freedom to come to him in this way, open, honest, and transparent. Throughout this pandemic season, maybe some of the most comforting words we can hear actually come from Jesus. From Matthew 11, 28, when he says, Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Certainly Mary and Martha were carrying one of the heaviest burdens that any of us can bear. The death of a loved one. And Peter reiterates this when he says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Mary and Martha, in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their loss, in the midst of their grief, they clung to the faith and to the reality that Jesus did care for them. And so what is it that both Mary and Martha do? They accept the gracious invitation to come to Jesus with their sorrows and their disappointment, their hurts, their questions, and yes, probably even their anger. Lord, if you had only been here. And Jesus has extended this very same invitation to you and I. When, when Mary confronts Jesus a little bit later on in the story with her, her sorrow, it says that Jesus was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. It's important that we don't pass over this portion of the story quickly because it's one of the most important connecting points that we have with Jesus. John describes Jesus as being deeply moved. That word literally means stirred up. We find the same word being used about the the pool of Bethesda earlier in the gospel. If you remember, there was a paralyzed man who was waiting for an angel to come and to stir the water. Matthew uses this same word to describe describe King Herod when the wise men tell him of the birth of a new king, a new king of the Jews. It says he was shaken to the core. We start to picture what's going on within the heart of Jesus here. One translation, a Phillips translation of the New Testament says Jesus was deeply moved and visibly distressed. And then it simply says poignantly that Jesus wept. What caused this enormous show of emotion on Jesus' part? Was it simply the sorrow that he saw in Mary and Martha, these two sisters? Was it the loss of his good friend Lazarus that caused him to be so deeply moved, moved to tears? I'm sure that was a huge part of it. But I think there's more. At this moment, Jesus is confronting the sacredness of human life. Confronting the fact that life, not death, is God's intention. And life is God's gift. And so as Jesus is standing there outside the tomb, he was standing face to face with the scandal of death. You know, in our fallen world, we've in some ways come to terms with death. 
Yes, we grieve over it when it steals a loved one from us, whether they're 80 years old or six months old. But we've come somehow to accept its inevitability. For Jesus, in whom was life, and for the scripture, death remains the enemy, an atrocity, an outrage against creation. Jesus, the one who came that we might have life, who brings life in its fullness, has come face to face with not only the sacredness of life, but the evilness of death. And from this comes the proclamation. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. What takes place here is this remarkable conversation with Jesus. Jesus, still trembling with emotions, has stirred so deeply within him. He walks determinedly to this, this great stone that's been rolled across Lazarus' tomb. And he says, take away the stone. And Martha protests because Lazarus has been in that tomb for four days. She tells Jesus, there's going to be a stench. It was the stench of death. But Jesus would not be deterred. And so the stone is rolled away and Jesus cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And then John tells us the dead man came out. A dead man raised, brought back to life. Even with this amazing miracle, it is sad to realize that there was going to come a day there was going to come a time when Lazarus would die again. I, I, I was reflecting on this and, I, and I, I got to thinking that maybe what he experienced, Lazarus experienced that day, was not so much resurrection at that point, but resuscitation. This is the last and probably the most powerful of the seven signs in the Gospel of John Gospel of, John, Gospel of John showing us who Jesus is. And like every other sign, it points to something greater than itself. That even death, even death is defeated. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, wrote the Apostle Paul. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. On Monday this past week, I stood at the graveside of my first COVID-19 funeral. I couldn't help but think about how on this day, the fullness of God's victory was not just a hope, but it was a present reality, an all-compassing reality. Like Lazarus in his tomb, who hears the loud voice of Jesus telling him to come out of the tomb. John, the writer of Revelation, also hears a loud voice proclaiming life. And it says, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them as their God. They will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. Until that day comes, and it will, death and grief will continue to be a part of our lives. And there will be times when we too will be deeply distressed. When we want to scream out from the depths of our soul, God, where were you? God, where are you? Where we want to cry out, God, if only. And at those times, we remember the one who came to bring us life. 
has won that victory at the cost of his own life. The one who promised Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, was the one who cried on the cross for you and me, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Surely, he not only knows, but he bears our deepest griefs and carries our sorrows. And he comes that we might have life, not only for eternity, but also for the here and now. Amen.